Well, we're going to be back in the book of Psalms tonight. Psalms chapter 8. We're going to look at the whole chapter, all nine verses. And we started a study uh, just last Wednesday, so we're just two weeks in. Uh, the pulpit's still on there. That's why you're getting that. There you go. Uh, just last week we started this, Lyrics for Life. And uh, we're going to look at some, some different psalms, not every one of them, but we're going to look at some, probably some of the shorter ones, and uh, try to make a little bit more sense out of it and how it applies to our lives uh, as we walk with Christ. And uh, tonight, well, we'll get to this. Last week we uh, covered Psalm 1, and the principle that kind of ran through that lesson was learning to relate biblical truth to life and uh, not not standing, sitting, and uh, walking with the scornful boat, uh, living for Christ. And so we talked about that last week. Uh, tonight we're going to look at, again, Psalm uh, 8. And uh, we're going to look at the topic tonight of undeserved attention. Undeserved attention. Have you ever gotten attention from somebody you wish wouldn't give you attention? Y'all been there? My wife went through, she, she, she's here so I can I can talk about her now. But uh, <laughs> she, she went through a period of her life a couple years ago that... Everywhere she went, uh, some weirdo, wacko, drug-addicted, crazy man would come up and say, Hey, baby! And uh, and uh, she was getting attention from people she didn't want attention from. And sometimes the kids were with her and they're like, Mom, I'm laughing at her. But uh, we've all been there, right? Sometimes we want attention and can't get it. And sometimes we get attention we, we don't want. And uh, tonight we're going to look at undeserved attention. We're going to read the psalm here, but we're going to do it a little bit differently tonight. Instead of reading the whole thing at the beginning, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of read the verse as we go with the outline uh, and kind of show you so you kind of have that fresh in your mind as we cover the point. And uh, David here, he opens verse uh, uh, this chapter 8, and he actually closes the chapter uh, with a burst of praise to God and his greatness. Uh, he praises his name, he praises his glory, and between verse 1 and verse number 9, he spends those intermittent verses there just, just describing why God is so good and why we should praise him, and, and thanking him for, for his goodness to us when we really don't deserve it. Uh, have you ever been recognized for something, and in the back of your mind you probably thought, I really don't deserve this. <laughs> you ever been there? Or, or if you're humble enough to say, I probably don't deserve this, but I'll take you know I'll take the award. Uh, that's happened to us sometimes. You ever you ever met, ha, had somebody maybe famous, and you met them or whatever, and they and they paid attention to you, and you thought, man, this is pretty cool. Some of you're like, no, I never <laughs> never met anybody famous. That's okay, nothing wrong with that. But um, when, when when you get something you don't deserve, or maybe somebody important pays attention to you. Um, usually you feel kind of humbled by that, and you feel undeserving of that, and you feel appreciative of that. Psalm 8 is going to give us a very clear picture of the undeserved attention that God gives to us, and then it's going to challenge us to praise Him for that. And so that's what we want to look at in this chapter. Psalm 8 is a, is a praise psalm. Uh, it's a short piece. David, again, marvels at God's majesty and His glory, and he praises Him for the undeserved attention that he gives to us. So we'll get right into our outline tonight. You can probably guess the first point because of what I just said. Number one, praise the Lord. Very simple outline, okay? Uh, we're going to start with it. We're going to end with it. So there you go. If you're guessing the blanks ahead of time, you know what the last one is, all right? Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, and we're going to see this mentioned in verse number one. He opens Psalm, uh, Psalm 1, uh, uh, Psalm 8, I'm sorry, with a burst of praise. O Lord, he says this, O Lord, our Lord. How excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Uh, and this is how he opens that. And he's teaching us just in one simple verse to praise the Lord because of who he is, because of how awesome he is and great he is. The, uh, if you have one of those, uh, if you have a, a, a Bible that kind of breaks down your chapters, I don't know how many of you have this, but right under the chapter heading in Psalm 8, there's a little tagline. Do you have that in your Bible? And it says, to the chief musician upon Gittith, a psalm of David. Now, usually you read that and you're like, I just skipped that because it didn't mean anything to me, right? Unless you want to know who wrote it, maybe. Because uh, different, different people wrote various psalms. That phrase, the chief musician upon Gittith, a psalm of David, uh, this means it was a psalm that he wrote to the chief musician, uh, the director of music, if you will. 
Okay? And that's who David is writing and addressing this psalm to. It was probably used in temple worship uh, by the, the choir leader would lead the choir, the congregation, in singing the psalms. Many of these psalms, by the way, that's, how, that's what they were. They, were. they were set to music. They sang them as they traveled. They sang them in temple worship and those types of things. So this is kind of one of those musical types of psalms. Um, the, the words, upon getteth, and I know you're thinking, who cares? I'll just give you a little, little background here. Uh, those only appear in the Bible two other times. Psalm 81 and Psalm 84. And so you see them three times in the book of Psalms. Those words upon getteth. Uh, the meaning is not necessarily defined for us in Scripture. But if you look at getteth and what it was, and then of course maybe this being a musical psalm, uh, many folks think that this was referring to this psalm being a, uh, a Gittite lyre. Uh, you say, what do you mean? Uh, it was a festival song. It was, it was a musical term, this getteth. Um, and so David is identified as the writer, not connected necessarily with any event of his life, which some psalms are. You know, Psalm 51 is his repentance. Uh, so some psalms are connected. This is not necessarily connected to any, his particular thing in his life. But it demonstrates in, in, in this uh, chapter, which we'll see here in just a minute, it does demonstrate his familiarity with the uh, Genesis account of creation. Uh, and you'll see that here in, in a minute as we start to read. Uh, you'll kind of see what I'm talking about there. Um, so praise the Lord is how he starts this off. I'm going to give you two thoughts here why he teaches us to praise the Lord in this psalm. First of all, because of his excellent name. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. That's not how. It's not a question. It's a statement. How excellent is thy name. Now, I don't know about you, but there are words sometimes that we use in the English language, and we use them because we don't have a word that we can actually use that means what we want it to mean. Uh, illustration. For God so loved the world. How do you describe God's love? You can't. So what do we say? So, because so is kind of like that big all encompassing. That's kind of what he's saying with this word how. How excellent is thy name in all the earth. Now, I want you to notice something about this verse. And, and again, I, th I think this is important. I think, I think every word of God is there for a reason. I, I think it points us to some things as we study it. And if you look at verse number one, you have your Bible open? If not, I'll, I'm going to put it back here on the screen here for you. Uh, and I want you to see, uh, and I'll come back to that point here in a minute. I want you to see the first phrase there. O Lord, our Lord. Now, I want you to look real carefully at that phrase and tell me what you notice is different. What do you notice is different? O Lord, our Lord. It has nothing to do with the O or the R. <laughs> okay? Look at the two word Lords. This is not a typographical error. Okay? One's all caps. One is not. Why? Why? We're going to see why, okay? <laughs> let, let, let me look. Uh, uh, first of all, in his opening words, O Lord, our Lord, he uses two names for God. First of all, he uses that capital, L-O-R-D, uh, for, for, for God, uh, by the name L-O-R-D, capitals. Uh, this is the Hebrew, we would, we would use Yahweh, okay, which we would know today as Jehovah. Okay, what's, what's the important significance of Jehovah? This is a personal name that God gave himself to his people, for his people. It indicates his self-existence. Uh, it indicates his strength. It indicates his commitment to the covenants that he made with Israel because he is Jehovah. And so he starts with the excellent name of the Lord, and he mentions this thought of him being Jehovah. He, he secondly uses that word Lord in lowercase, capital L, lowercase. This is where we would get our word that we would say today, um, Adonai. Adonai. What does Adonai mean? It means God is a sovereign master. He's a sovereign master. It indicates his dominion over all of creation. Um, let me. I, I, I meant to point this out a second when I did when it when we talked about Jehovah. The the Israelites had such a great reverence for the name Jehovah. Do you realize that when they would write it, they wouldn't even write it. <laughs> you realize when they when they translated uh, the Bible, uh, they would get out a brand new quill if they wrote the word Jehovah. Uh, it wasn't the same. This is this is respect and this is reverence. You know, I thought about that and I thought, how flippantly today. Do people toss around the name of God? God this, God this, oh my God this, oh... And you hear it nonstop. And it's like, man, if we could get back to Israel's days having respect for the name of God, it might change our culture a little bit, amen? Uh, Jehovah was a big deal. 
Uh, and then, of course, then Adonai is the next one mentioned. Uh, he is sovereign master, dominion over creation. Uh, David addresses God as the personal and faithful God of his people and the one who is sovereign over his creation. Uh, he, he says something about that name. If you continue reading verse number one, it says, How excellent is thy name. The word excellent, what that means is marked by majesty, splendor, and magnificence. Have you ever had, have you ever asked somebody, oh, you, you know, you meet their, them and their child, or say, hey, what's your kid's name? And they tell you, and you're like, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty name, right? Or you meet somebody, they tell your kid's name, and you're like, what? Can you spell that? <laughs> Would you get that off like a back of a cereal box? Where, where, where'd that come from, you know? You just join two words and make it up, but we've been there, right? And then you hear somebody's name, oh, a uh, middle name and a first name put together, oh, that's beautiful, right? Do you realize there is no name under heaven, in heaven, above heaven, anywhere, as excellent as the name of our Lord? And David is really pushing this just in the first verse. He is saying, hey, praise him because of his name. His name is marked by excellence and majesty and splendor and magnificence. Uh, the name of God here in, in verse number one, it does more than just identify who he is. Uh, it's the sum total of his attributes. It expresses to us that he is faithful uh, in all things. Praise the Lord, David says, first of all, for his excellent name. Secondly, he says to praise him for his exalted glory. Uh, he goes on in that verse to say, Set thy glory above the heavens. You realize the ancients looked to the heavens as the farthest known reaches of creation. Nothing was above or greater than the heavens. But David says this, his glory is, his glory is, Above the heavens, it's above his creation. He is greater and superior than anything in the heavenlies. He's greater and superior than anything scientifically speaking. He is greater and superior than anything he created. Praise the Lord uh, for his excellent name. But also he teaches us this. Praise the Lord for his, his exalted glory. You realize the majesty and glory and the power of God is all over the place? You, know, you ever walk out, your, you ever walk out of your, your house in the morning and the sun's rising? Of course you walk out of your house i understand but but that sun is rising and you look and say wow that's beautiful and then you're like i gotta go back in it's hot right that's what we do in arizona that's beautiful i'm going back in <laughs> and, and you go out at night and that sun is starting to set and boy the beautiful pictures that you can take just the beauty of creation you know what that is that's a stamp of god's glory that's a stamp uh, 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 of god's uh, majesty being everywhere so david starts the psalm in one verse he says praise the lord Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Number two. Number two, in the next few verses, verses two through eight, he teaches us now not just to praise his excellent name and his glory. Now he says, I want you to praise the Lord for undeserved attention that he shows us. If you really think about it, do we deserve any attention from the Creator? <laughs> no. He outbursts, he has an outburst of praise in verse number one. Uh, oh Lord, our Lord. And he praises him. Now, in the next few verses, he reflects on why God deserves that praise. And I think we, if we look at these thoughts uh, from the perspective of God's care towards us, it'll make us see why David is praising him. So praise him for his under attention. I put down a couple of thoughts here. Uh, verse number two, we're going to see this thought. He uses children to defend himself. You say, what? I mean, if, I, if I'm in trouble or somebody's accusing me, the last thing I want is a child defending me, right? Nobody believes a child. They make stuff up, right? Are you kids, right? We make stuff up all the time, right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, but, you, you know, you want a, a defense attorney. You want this. You want this. You want somebody to record. God uses children to defend himself. Look at verse number two. Verse number two. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. That's not Marvel Avengers, okay? That's not Thor and the Hulk and all those guys, all right? Out of the mouth of babes, God uses children to defend who he is and, and his attributes and his glory. Um, Christ quotes Psalm 8 2. Uh, if you go to the New Testament, we're going to turn to Mary. If you go to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 21, Jesus has cleansed the temple a second time. And, and he actually quotes this verse. 
Uh, the children are in the temple. They're witnessing uh, Christ's healing of the blind and the lame man. Uh, they're crying in verse 15 in Matthew 21. They're crying, uh, Hosanna to the son of David. Uh, what are they saying? That's the Messiah. That's what that means. That's the Messiah. Well, let me ask you a question. If you're claiming he's the Messiah, what do you think the Pharisees are going to do? They're going to be pretty upset about that, okay? And it's exactly what happens. The religious leaders and the Pharisees are questioning the validity of these children's praise. How can they say that about him? Christ responds to the Pharisees, and he quotes Psalm 8 too, and he says that out of the mouth of babes. Well, I use them uh, the still the enemy. Still the enemy. God uses children to declare his worthiness. Think about that. God using children is pretty humbling, is it not? That's pretty amazing. David marveled that God uses the strength, if you want to call it strength, of a little child. Uh, you know, most of us say, well, children aren't very strong. But he uses the, st the small amount of strength of a child to silence the enemy. How could a child defend the Lord against the enemies? Uh, again, if you go back to this incident here in Matthew chapter 21, you notice who, were, who was silenced in Matthew chapter 21? It was the Pharisees. God did exactly what Psalm 8, 2 says he would do. He used the children to silence the critics, silence the enemies. There was no longer a religious protest following in those verses. Uh, we can surmise the children just kind of continued to praise the Lord then. And the Lord used humble children to silence the enemies. Uh, you know, sometimes if you think about this, have we not seen God use children to soften the hearts of parents, grandparents, siblings, uh, leading to their salvation many times. He uses children sometimes in the science class at school. Amen? Wait a minute. We didn't come from monkeys. My Bible says. Right? <laughs> and I know not every science class in every school teaches that, but you, you know what I'm saying. He uses children. Uh, the simple faith. Well, by the way, what, is, what, is, what are we taught in Scripture about salvation? It takes the faith of a, of a child. So he uses children. He gives undeserved attention to the children. He lets their words and their actions defend him. Praise the Lord he uses children. Amen? But look at this next thought. The next thing I put down is this. Oh, let me get the point up there. There you go. He gives attention to all mankind. All mankind deserves his attention. Look at verse 3 and 4. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest to him. David takes his attention now from God using children, and he says this, now God is showing undeserved attention to every human, to all of mankind, men and women in general. He scans the vastness of God's creation, the night sky, and he marvels that God would give any attention to us when he made that. What, we don't deserve it. Uh, David re refers specifically, by the way, if you look at this passage, he refers very specifically to the moon and the stars. Uh, this psalm may have been used in evening worship uh, because of that, 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 that thought about the moon and the stars. Uh, by the way, don't you, don't you notice a lot more of God's creation at night when you see the moon and the stars? And the, It's so neat. Isn't that awesome? And so maybe this was used as a night. We don't, we don't know for sure. Uh, but David used the Hebrew word for mankind that emphasizes man's mortality and weakness. What is he saying? God, we are nothing, yet you love us. God, we are nothing, yet you show us favor. God, we are nothing, but you give us attention. David gazes into the sky and he sees the moon and the stars and he calls those bodies, in, that, in verse number three, he calls them the work of thy fingers. Now, this doesn't matter. This won't get you into heaven or anything. But uh, uh, when, when he mentions that, that, that figure of speech is called an anthropomorphism. <laughs> you know what an anthropomorphism is? Okay, good, good. Heidi's right on it. it. It's giving a human characteristic to God, his fingers. Uh, it, it's saying that God is like the sculptor whose fingers fashion the heavenly bodies. Now, here's the great thing about God. We know he didn't fashion the heavenly bodies with his hands. He spoke it into existence. Amen? Uh, but, but, and by the way, and, and the Bible also says that his, the, the heavens are like the, the, his, his, uh, the span of his hand. It talks about that. Uh, that's a pretty big hand. Amen? <laughs> 
But this is, this is given that attribute so humans can kind of put their thought processes around it. Uh, he portrays God as this great sculptor of the heavenlies. Uh, and he reflects on that. By the way, David sees this and probably thinks, wow. And you realize David didn't have scratched the surface of what we know today about the heavenlies. Think about it. Think about what we know today and how far our, 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 our uh, what are those dudes called that look at the stars? Astronomers. Think, think about all the, all the things that they have found. Uh, the planets and the, and the different solar systems and all. You think about all this. David didn't even know all that, yet he says, just that alone is enough to say, with all that, God, why are you messing with me? Why do you love me? <laughs> why do you show me any attention to this puny, insignificant man? By the way, can I just say this real quick? If that would be our thought process, I'm a puny, insignificant human. God, why are you showing me any attention? Instead of, hey, God, look at me. You're lucky that I'm serving you. I think our churches might just catch fire a little bit more. I think the gospel might spread a little bit faster. I think we might see kingdom results here on this earth if our attitude was, was I'm, I'm a puny human being, God. Yet you show me attention. And you let me serve you. What is man, he says, that thou art mindful of him? Why do you give me any attention, God? This psalm, uh, in this particular verse, it uses the English word mindful. Mindful. It conveys the idea, when you think of mindful, what does that sound like? Your, your mind is full of ideas, right? So what is it saying? David is saying this, your mind is full of thoughts about me and thoughts about us. By the way, we're not, we're not going to cover this chapter or anything right now, but Psalm 139, 17 says this, How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great is the sum of them. Hmm? Hmm? Isn't that awesome? God thinks about us. Insignificant, puny, wretched, sinful man, creator of the universe says, I think about you. I care about you. I'll show you attention. God gives us, uh, 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 think, about, uh, think about, just a couple things. He gives us a climate to live in. I know it's hot here. I get that. But he gives us a climate in our, in our country that's, that's bearable just about everywhere, right? I know there are seasons. I get all that. And there's a reason for the seasons as well. And he sends rain when it's necessary to help food grow and the water supply and all that. He spares us from sometimes great disasters being greater. Um, by the way, the, the rainbow that's being claimed today as a symbol of what it's not for, that's a symbol of God saying, I'll never destroy the world in that fashion of a flood again. It's a beautiful picture. He enables us to make advances in technology, in health care, uh, easing the burden of life in the degree of enjoyment we get out of life. He allows all that. Why? Because he loves us. Undeserved attention. I'm going to give you a little, a little thought here tonight. What is undeserved attention like? God's interest in us. Let me, let me show you what it's like us being interested in, okay? And I just threw a few random things up here. It, oh, you need cute little puppy. Uh, it's like us being interested on the fleas of a dog. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I changed that five times, too, because it didn't fit. It's us being, it's us being uh, interested. I don't care. I, I don't want my dog to have fleas, but if, I'm not, I'm not going to, oh, let me see the Care? Right? It's a little bit thing. It's, it's like us being interested in the gnats in the backyard. You know, they're, they're a little insignificant. They, the things don't matter. The mosquitoes in a swamp. Now, I know they'll bite you, right? You don't want to be around them, but it's not something I study. It's not something I put a lot of interest into. These are little, small, insignificant things. The mud on the bottom of the river. You know, who cares, right? I don't care. It's, it's an insignificant thing. How about the dust balls under the bed? Or in Arizona, on every surface in your house, right? I just dusted that yesterday. There's another inch on there, two inches. But do, do, do you see? Do you see the comparison? I know. It's, I know it's silly, but I'm just trying to trying to make a thought. God's interest in us would be like us being interested in those little bitty things. And yet, what does He say? Cast all your care upon Me, because I care for you. 
when you're we're made when when you're heavy and burdened and late and laden down with, with, with care, come to me, I'll give you rest. He cares about us, he thinks about us. What an awesome God David is praising. The third thing that let her see there, he says to praise him because we've been given an exalted position. An exalted position. Now again, this is not something to be prideful of. This is something to be thankful and praising for. Look at verse number 5. For thou hast made him, talking about man, a little lower than who? The angels. And hast crowned him with glory and honor. That's pretty awesome. Thou madest him have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Um, I, I stopped there, but I'll read the other couple of verses there. Um, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. David here reflects on the fact that God cares for us so much, and now he says, I'm further impressed because God has given us dominion. God has given us an amplified, dignified role in his creation. Uh, the exalted position, uh, he says, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Now, of course, where are the angels? They're in heaven spending time with him right now. Uh, where will we be one day? In heaven spending time with him one day. So, so, so we haven't quite attained angel status, amen. I know somebody think, oh, my little, my little grandchild's an angel. No, she's not. She's wicked as the devil, amen. Because the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Uh, <laughs> we're not angels. We're not quite there. But think about this. Did he not give us dominion over all other creatures? Uh... We have it. We have that role of being above the animals, being made in the image of God, a little lower than the heavenly beings, but but definitely above the the uh, the beasts of the field, if you will, of the, of the ocean. Uh, he reinforced this thought, and he says this: He has crowned us with glory and honor. Now, what do you think about when you think of crowned king? You think of royalty, right? We and if you think about it, in reality, are we not kings? Yeah, we're, we're in a royal family. Uh, we're going to celebrate that with him one day. Uh, so he speaks about the glory of God in verse number one. And then he declares that mankind also has some glory that has been given to him by God. Uh, crowned with, with glory and honor. Uh, God further shows his undeserved attention to Adam, uh, to Adam's race, mankind, by, by giving him dominion over the creatures. Putting all things under his feet. You remember in the Garden of Eden? Uh, God said, Adam, you're in charge. Why is a cow a cow? Because Adam said so. Right? <laughs> Why is a heart a heart? Because Adam said so. Why is a platypus a platypus? Adam said so. <laughs> all right? And I know some of those things have, you know, we've seen crossbreeding all that kind of thing. But he was given dominion over all those things. David was amazed that God would exalt mankind to such a place of honor. Uh, to be just under the angels, but then have dominion over all God's creation. God's creation. Now, of course, uh, today we see that uh, uh, we domesticate animals and then we use them for food. Amen? We raise cows and what do we do? Eat them. <laughs> some, some don't eat them. You raise pigs and what do you do? You get bacon. Amen? Right? And uh, we understand that. And I'm not one of those guys that's like, you know, go out and kill a bunch of animals. But uh, we kill animals to eat animals. I understand that. What we need to understand is this. Human life is more valuable than animal life. We're made in the image of God. You, you ever hear these people, save the whales, save the whales, save the whales. And I'm like, how about save the babies, save the babies, save the babies. Amen? Uh, we got to understand the distinction there. And David says, hey, we got it good. <laughs> we got it good. God has given us undeserved attention uh, because he loves us. And let me give you the last thing, number three. Number three, he closes out with verse number nine. And once again, what does he say? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He concludes this psalm with a, another burst of praise to the Lord for the undeserved high position he has given to man and for the goodness of God. His heart was so full of praise. He takes uh, verse number 1 and he, uh, he pretty much quotes most of it back down in verse number 9. And he closes with this thought. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth! Exclamation point. Why is there an exclamation point? Yeah, it, it shows he's exclaiming something. He's excited about something. Uh, David portrays the high position, 
not just that God has given us, but he portrays the, he portrays the high position that God has. Uh, he did not conclude, by the way, he did not conclude after, after verse 5 through 8, talking about how we have dominion or close to the angel. He doesn't conclude verse 9 and say, hey, beat your chest and be happy for what you got. What does he do? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He turns our attention back again and says, uh, don't, don't praise yourself because God's been good to you. Praise God because what he's done for you is totally, totally, totally undeserved. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. I'm still nothing. But praise God, amen? Because God is everything. Never, never, never for one minute, ever, ever, ever use this phrase. I deserve better than this. No, we don't. Uh, we, we deserve hell. We deserve eternal punishment, damnation. We don't deserve better than this. My daughter asked me uh, a couple days ago, she said, Dad, why do bad things happen to good people? And uh, somebody asked her. <laughs> so uh, they said, your dad's a preacher. You're going to ask him if you don't know. So she asked me. And maybe you'll hear a sermon about this one day. But uh, I went through a list of reasons. But the first thing I said was this. Bad things don't happen to good people. <laughs> there are no good people, number one. But number two, God doesn't do bad things. Everything God does is good. We may put it in the box of bad because we don't enjoy it, but he has a purpose even for those things. The things that we might look at with fleshly human eyes and say, that's a bad thing, God says, oh, no, 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 no. I've got a good thing in store for this if you'll let me work. Never, never, never say, I, I deserve better than this because we know we really don't. Uh, praise the Lord for his undeserved attention. By the way, next time you stop and sit down and pray, how about starting your prayer this way? Lord, I don't even deserve the attention that you're giving me by allowing me to talk to you. But thank you for allowing me to. Who are we showing? Praise for his undeserved attention. This week, uh, again, we looked at relating biblical truth last week. Praise God for his attention. That's the theme. That's, that's the, whole, the whole theme of Psalm chapter 8. Just praise him for his, for his attention. And remember, it is undeserved. We don't deserve any of it. Next week, we're going to look at another psalm. Uh, we'll also have a, a, a brief business meeting next Wednesday, just kind of a reminder for that, uh, voting on those resolutions for our, our constitutional changes to help with our deacon elections and all that. And uh, those are on the back back, uh, back uh, sound booth there. If you want to look at those again, you can see those. But uh, we'll, ha we'll have time to have our lesson and stuff as well uh, next week. We're going to look at Psalm 19. And uh, so if you want to read ahead again, not a, uh, not a real, real long chapter, uh, but we'll look at Psalm 19. And we're going to look at God's beneficial word. This is, this is not just a book, okay? It's not something to throw on a shelf. It's not old, antiquated stuff. It's not just history. This is beneficial. It's living. And it'll change our lives if we'll let it. We're going to look at Psalm 19 and see some of the descriptions and see some of the things that come of that uh, next Wednesday. So remember that. If you would, we get all of our blanks filled in? Yes? Awesome. All right. Other than spelling fleas wrong, did pretty good. All right. That's all right. I'm going to blame my wife. She typed it. No, she didn't. <laughs> I always say I'm going to fire my secretary, but I'm the one that types it, so I can't even do that. But uh, anyways, all right, let's pray together. Tonight we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. Uh, we thank you again, God, for your goodness. Thank you. Uh, like David says here, for your undeserved attention, God. We, we, we don't deserve anything from you. Uh, we don't deserve your listening ear. Uh, we don't deserve your mercies that are new every morning. Uh, we deserve nothing from you, God. And we're thankful that you think about us and you care about us enough to show us attention and to show us favor and to give us your mercy and your grace. And, and God, we're so thankful for your daily uh, loading us with benefits. And we're thankful, Lord, that you hear and answer prayer and that you take our burdens upon you and you listen to us when we have needs. And Father, we pray that we can uh, apply these thoughts tonight here from David. Just a simple chapter, simple outline, Lord, a simple message. Praise God for his attention in our lives. And Lord, may we uh, claim those thoughts now tonight, I pray.
Father, we ask as we go home, we just pray that you'll give us safety as we travel. And uh, bring us back again Sunday, Lord, as the uh, weekend services, Lord, we celebrate Father's Day and uh, we think about some different things there. We just pray that you'll bless uh, the activities this weekend with the men's uh, cookout and, Lord, in the services. And we just pray that we'll live for you this week and, and point people to you this week, Lord, I pray. And then bless everything that we do this weekend, Lord. May we magnify and honor you, we pray. And we ask all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. And goodbye. God bless you. Shake a couple hands on your way out. And we'll see you Sunday, men. We'll see you Saturday. If you didn't get signed up,